Hi, I'm William. And I'm David. Today we're going to talk to you about a monarch butterfly's relationship with milkweed. A monarch butterfly is extremely dependent on milkweed. It lays its eggs on milkweed and the caterpillar eats it. It's one of the only foods it will eat. And so this is a specimen of common milkweed right here. And you can already see signs of monarchs here. Um, see how the leaf, the leaves are chewed? Uh, and if you look carefully, you'll see the reason for that. Where is it? Right here. So this is a monarch caterpillar. Monarch caterpillars are toxic along with the butterflies. That's because the milkweed plant is toxic and when the caterpillar eats the plant, the tr toxins transfer. So this is where it gets its name, milkweed. And I believe this is also where the toxins are located. And if you um, are out looking for milkweed and butterflies, you may see a monarch on one of these plants uh, dipping underneath. And that, could ver that means that it is laying an egg under there. So this is common milkweed. And there are three main types of milkweed. Common milkweed, which likes a dry, plain area. Uh, swamp milkweed. Hence the name, like swamps, and then there's butterfly weed. So this is swamp milkweed, um, and you can see there are some differences between it and common milkweed. Mainly, um, if you remember, the edges of the other one were very round, it was very broad leaf. This one is more needle shaped. And I'm just going to look underneath. I'm not seeing any eggs under here. They may have all hatched for the season, but this is swamp milkweed. Hi, I'm Phil. I'm here to talk to you today about uh, propagating milkweed common milkweed specifically. Uh, you'll see these large capsules on the milkweed in the fall and you open it up and you'll see all kinds of uh, uh, seed in there. The dark browns is seed and the light uh, the lighter material, the white material is a uh, is a parachute and that'll cause them to just blow away and just go wherever. Uh, but if you get them at the right stage you can actually take that, open it up and see all the seeds just in the nice little column like that just take that and you get all those seeds you get a whole bunch of seeds real easily and you leave the uh, the parachute part in there uh, and these can be stored you can either store them dry through the winter you can sow them in the fall um, but they will germinate in the spring once temperatures warm up probably into the mid uh, soil temperature into low to mid 60s um, and depending on conditions they may get to be 12 to 18 inches tall the first year. Um, this is a plant that really does not grow very well in a container, um, but it will grow enough that you can get it, get it started. Uh, we've actually taken it and just broadcast the seed here. We may only have one or two percent germinate, but that's enough to actually get them going. Um, but that is a seed. Um, like I said, there's you can get pretty high germ or percentage of germination on these. Uh, in a container, you take them out and scatter them, it's going to be much lower, but you've got a lot less work into them. Once this plant's established, it also will send out uh, rhizomes, which will make a colony like this here. This may have all, all started as one plant, uh, and just sends out rhizomes uh, for new plants. And you know, like I said, the seeds come on in the fall, and this is about time you want to pick them. If you wait till they're totally brown, they, they start splitting open. And all that seed just flies away. So you want to start start about mid-September, depending on where you're at, and just pick them and just open that up and gather the seeds like that, and then, and then just store them dry. And that's it. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Brian, and what we're here to talk about is the uh, restoration plans here at the Boyer Farm. When the zoo uh, received this property a number of years ago, this was basically a working farm. It was all cornfields, uh, agricultural areas. And what we've done is we've actually came in and seeded it, and as you can see the fields through here, uh, with a lot of diversity. And with that diversity, we're, we're, with the mix of plants that we've chosen, uh, it's become a mecca for everything from birds, pollinators. Uh, you can see the monarchs out here when they come through on migrations. Uh, and by mixing all of these together, you have both the larval sources, which are the milkweeds. You also have the nectar sources, which are extremely valuable to, uh, to a number of species. Um, and even this um, solidago here, this goldenrod, uh, right now there's, there's dozens of species of insects on it. 
that are, uh, are working, and most notably the honeybee, which has been imperiled for uh, a while now, but uh, they seem to be doing quite well uh, here on this uh, goldenrod. But by choosing all of that, we, we provide food and cover for a wealth of species, um, a very, very broad spectrum of, of, of uh, wildlife, and we're able to use that, they're able to use that throughout the entire year. So we try to get as much diversity here, whether it's the grasses, the, uh, the, the blue stems, um, the golden rods, and certainly you can see the asters, which will give that very late season uh, nectar source that these um, uh, organisms need. The monarchs, as they're flying south, they need the milkweed basically to keep their egg laying and larval phases going. But once these uh, insects are starting to head south, they need nectar sources that they can find readily to fuel up as they head their way down to Mexico. So by putting in these late blooming plants, uh, the edgeratums, the asters, uh, we're able to provide that for, uh, for the species.